Good evening, and welcome to Bible study. Now, as we head into Holy Week, so this um, coming weekend will be a Palm Sunday of the Passion of the Lord. So it's got a new title. It used to we just call it, used to call it just Palm Sunday, but now we're trying to get the Palm and the Passion business all together. So it's Palm Sunday of the Passion of the Lord. It's an unusual Sunday. It's the only Sunday of the year when we have two Gospels proclaimed. We have one at the beginning when we have the Palm reading. And then we have the Passion at the regular time in the Liturgy of the Word. For Bible study to do f two full chapters of the Passion, um, that, that's just a little bit bigger than we can manage. So on this week, we usually do the uh, Palm Sunday reading rather than the Passion reading or a, a portion of the Passion reading. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. But before we get there, we always begin with our opening prayer. So let's begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now this Psalm, Psalm 22 is about the passion of the Messiah, and you've heard it, so you're think, we're thinking very much not the Palm Sunday part, but the passion part as we begin. The prayer goes, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my prayer, from the words of my cry. Oh my God, I cry out to you by day, and you answer not by night, and there is no relief for me. I am a worm, not a man, the scorn of men, despised by people. All who see me scoff at me. They mock me with parted lips. They wag their heads. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he loves him. Be not far from me, for I am in distress. Be near, for I have no one to help me. I am like water poured out. All my bones are racked. My heart has become like wax, melting away within my bosom. My throat has dried up like baked clay. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, to the dust of death. You have brought me down. Indeed, many dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look on me and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. But you, O Lord, be not far from me. O my help, hasten to help me. So, mighty God, as we come to the very end of Lent, and as we prepare to celebrate, to recall your passion and death, we ask you to give us strength as we go through these days. Help us to reflect on all that you suffered on our behalf. And as we realize that it was our sins that put you on the cross, help us to be grateful for your gift of salvation and redemption and to show our appreciation by living good and holy lives. Help us to be more virtuous day by day. May we always follow your light. May your light guide us in all our paths, and may all that we do be pleasing to you. And on this night, Almighty God, we ask that you would send us your Holy Spirit to enlighten us so that our minds would better understand your word, and that with our hearts we would love you all the more. And we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Okay. Now, as we kind of focused on the passion to begin with, we're going to kind of shift up so the, the, the liturgy, and I've got a little article on that in your material. For those of you who are watching, um, your first attachment was the commentary. Your second comment uh, attachment was the uh, site notes. And then one of the articles right after that talks about, um, it's entitled um, Palm Duel, I think. And so it's a dual feast. So you're third to the last page. It says, Palm Sunday of the Passion of the Lord, a dual feast. So what happens at the very beginning of Mass is that it's very joyful, it's triumphant, it's waving palms and singing Hosanna and hail to the King and King of David and all of that. So there's a very upbeat, excited kind of thing. And you have that all, and then you shift to the Liturgy of the Word, and you've got a suffering servant canticle, and then we got Psalm 22 that we just did, and then we have another... Uh, reading uh, um, from Paul's letter to the Philippians that talks about how Jesus embraced the cross, and then we have the passion. I mean, it just goes somber after that glorious beginning. So the, the Mass has two radically different moods. 
So it's a dual feast. It talks about the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and then we have the passion after that. Now, what we're going to do for Bible study today is we're going to do the first part, not the second part. We're going to do the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And in the opening of the reading, if you look on the upper left, as a crowd drew near Pet Page and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, we're going to go to the church in Beth Page, and we're going to look at that church. We're going to go up on the top of the Mount of Olives, and then we're going to track, um, look at all of the things inside that church. And then I've got some nice artwork about Palm Sunday to kind of finish that up. Now, um, at the end of the notes, for those of you who are here, the notes go to, where do they go? They go as far as page seven, if you're counting from the front. And then when you get to page seven, then we have a new set of notes after that. And you can see where it says bet page right there. And so this gives you the site notes, and there's three pages of site notes um, in your packet. For those of you who um, receive this at home, there's four pages. I reduced this down to get it onto three pages. So yours is in 12 point and ours is in 11. At any rate, more, th- more information than you ever wanted to know. But I've got the thing about uh, the biblical references and the things that happened there. And right in the middle it says that the first church that was there was probably built in the 380s. Then there was a church that was built there during the 12th century, that's during the Crusader period. And I'm going to show you the foundations to the church from the Crusader period. And then the new church was in two phases. Its initial construction was in 1883, and then it was completely renovated in 1950. So the the church that you're going to see is the 1950 renovation at the site of the church that was there from the 4th century. Now, during the time of Jesus, this was out of town. A hundred years ago, it was out of town. Right now, it's like our suburbs. I mean, they grow out and grow out. And so the suburbs of Arab East Jerusalem has grown around it. And I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. So when we talk about Arab East Jerusalem, it's the north and east side of Jerusalem that's all Palestinian. When you go east of the Temple Mount and you go up to Bethany, that whole thing, that's all Palestinian, predominantly Muslim, a little bit Christian, okay? And then we go out to the desert, which is just a hair further out than that. And to confuse you, it's part of the West Bank. It's East Jerusalem and part of the West Bank. The West Bank of what? The West Bank of the Jordan River. But remember that the Jordan River goes all the way down to Jericho, huh? And so there's about 20, 25 miles that come right up to Jerusalem that are all part of the West Bank. And it comes right up to the city of Jerusalem and encompasses the Mount of Olives. So I hope that's not too confusing. But at any rate, I didn't put any maps in here to show you that, but we'll be okay. Are you ready to go? We're going to take our, a look at Pet Page. Now, we're going to be looking at the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. This particular fresco is at the Russian Orthodox Church of the Ascension, which is about three or four blocks away from the church we're going to go to visit. And so, I mean, they were trying to commemorate some of the beautiful things that go on in the area. So this is one of about five or six different ways that Bet Page is um, spelled. Every one of them is okay, and I've got the whole list of them in your notes. And then that's Arabic um, below it. Okay, so here's the city. And so right now I'm standing on the top of the Mount of Olives and not looking toward Jerusalem, which would be looking to the west, but turning around and looking to the east. Now you can see that it's very mountainous, huh? Mountain hill, big, big valley, more hill, valley over there, mountains further out. This is kind of a, north, a northern, northeasterly look. But you can see that there's a lot of stone kind of buildings right along in here, okay? So I got a couple of kids that were sitting out there on their balcony. This is one of the nicer homes. Most of the area is pretty poor, okay? And walking through here, um, they could tell that I was not a local, and they were pretty friendly to me as I was walking through the area. All right. This is, uh, gives you a, probably a little bit better view of how poor it is. You can see how rocky it is. There's nothing growing. Very plain stone homes. They have actually metal gates over all the windows. They're trying to, um, there's a lot of crime in the area. And I mean, people don't even have uh, dryers, so they have their clothes all hanging out. Uh, very limited electrical supply and so forth. Now, let me see here. When you look, there, this is the Bet Page Church right here. And so we're looking from quite a distance, looking straight east. And where the wilderness of Judea is in the haze beyond it. 
Okay, now this is getting up much closer to it. And so we're going to look at the church up and close, but you can see that there is a wall enclosure all the way around it. And you can see that there's a road here and it keeps going that way. I've walked that road multiple times. Bethany is about five or six blocks down the way. So it's very, very close, Bethany and Bethpage. All right, so this is looking at the church a little bit more close up. There is the, how is how, that for a beautiful road to Bethany? So I mean, and you walk through here and there's high walls on both sides and you hope nobody jumps over the wall and it's a little adventurous, whatever. Okay, now I've backed up far away again. Why are we backing up far away? So there's the church I was talking about. Here's a great big hill up here. And so uh, one of the patriarchates for the Greek church, Greek Orthodox church, is up here on the hill. And so I'm trying to give you a little perspective. I'll show you the church, but I'm standing on the hill when I take pictures coming down. So it'll give you a better perspective about where I was when I took the pictures. So right now I'm taking them from a distance right up on the top of the Mount of Olives, a few of you have been to Israel, and so you know where the Paternoster Church is? And so this is like a block away from the Paternoster Church. Okay, so we're looking up at the top of the hill, and then we're up on the top of the hill. So there's the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate. A Patriarchate, um, what would we co compare that to? So you know how Arched Archdiocese has the, diocese, the chancery, or the pastoral center? It's the headquarters of the diocese. This is the headquarters of the Greek Orthodox Church, in Jerusalem. They don't call it a, because they're, they don't have a bishop, they have a patriarch, they call it a patriarchate rather than a chancery. It's just subtleties and the differences of the terminology. Okay, now I'm standing up there and looking down. Now we're getting a look at the south wall. So this is the wall that goes along the road. Remember I showed you the road before. The church comes back this far. That's one of the steeples there. And this is the front entrance and it faces west. You can see how the, um, the wall goes along on the west side, and this is the north side. And I'll give you close-ups of all of this here in a moment. Okay, so this is the road right by the entryway. This is going up to the north. You're going to see this quarterfoil. The next picture is going to do this much of it. So we're going to take a little bit to the right, and there's the right. So I, you saw this before, huh? And so that's the front of the church. And so this is not at ground level. There's a ramp down and a ramp down to get into the main gate. So there are the ramps down that I was telling you about. So there's the main gate right there. And so I got right back up in front again. So we're looking at the main gate with the entry sign. You can see that there's a Latin cross on the front. And remember, we're Latin rite or Roman rite. So when you see a church like this, you go, oh, this is one of us. So I could say mass here. The church I showed you, the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate before, I could not say mass in a Greek Orthodox place. So... Uh, it, it, these different denominational differences make a difference. All right, so there's the entry sign. And so this is, the reason I put this on here is so you can see the tower. Now, does that look like a steeple of a church to you? It does not. It maybe looks like a guard tower, doesn't it? This tells you about the original construction of this church during the Crusader period. The Crusaders were soldiers and they built the front of the church to look like a guard tower. And so the other side of the church looks like a steeple, and so this is part of the history of the church and why the design is the way that it is. Now this is the front of it. So we were just looking at the south side of it, now we're looking at the west side of it. And so it's not a very big entryway, and so you can see these little places up here. You know when they had those guard towers, how they had to have spaces for the soldiers to get in between here? They shoot their arrows, drop their boiling oil and drop their rocks and all that stuff on people that are trying to attack. So that's part of the, the, the way the feature was construction-wise. All right. This is from the southwest corner. This is uh, just for another angle. Now, when you look at the front of it, in addition to the guard tower top, you see this round thing with this cross. So this is a Greek cross here, and then there's a Greek cross on all four quadrants. This is not a Jerusalem cross. The name of this kind of a cross is called a Cantoni cross. And so uh, I always like to try and po point that out to folks. On a Jerusalem cross, uh, instead of having one Greek cross in the middle, you know, you remember we've talked about tau crosses, they look like a T? So this would be a, would have a, a cross beam over here, 
and then it would have a cross beam over there. That's what differentiates it from a Jerusalem cross. I didn't put a Jerusalem cross in here to compare it, but that is a Cantonese cross. And one of the nicer ones I've ever seen in the Holy Land. Then underneath it, you'll have a tripper archway thing. Remember this because when we go inside the church, this is going to be replicated inside the church from an architectural or a design point of view. This was very, very nicely put together. Then when you go down, this is the northwest corner of it. We're going to go down the, the north side of the church there. So there's a kind of a walkway along the side. And then you can see the steeple up here. We're going to give you the steeple a little more close up. This is the steeple from the other side. Okay, so the, that, um, the guard tower thing that I was talking to you about, that's about right here. That's, this is the length of the church going to that far over. All right. And so this is looking at it from a distance. You know where I showed you the Greek Orthodox Patriarch? It, it's up the hill over there. And you can see that we've got a Latin cross. I'll show you this up close. Let's do that right there, okay? So you can see the Latin cross. So there's a Latin cross on both sides of the church that lets you know that it's Roman rite. Then you can see that we have a quarterfoil here. It looks like a Greek cross, but it has rounded sides on all four sides. So that's a different kind of cross. And then we have a double arch here with a bell in each arch. This is sitting right over the top of the altar. So this is on the east side of the church. And the other part was on the west entrance. All right. So now we have kind of, this is the, the north side of the church, northwest corner, the west side. This is on the far east side. Kind of gets you all situated. It's not very big, is it? It's actually quite small. When you look at the side of it, see how rough the rocks are here? You see how newer the rocks are here? This is a differentiation between the construction 12th century and the, 18, the late 1800s when we did the rebuild, 1883. 12th century, 1883. Another angle on it. This is the uh, south side of it. That's the courtyard on the south side. All right. There's the arch over the entryway. So there's a little bitty vestibule, and it's got some inscriptions right here and some inscriptions on the other side. This is the one you see to begin with. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass. Now, I'm sorry that this is a little blurry, but it says Zechariah 9, chapter 9, verse 9. Now, people were looking forward for when the Messiah would come to Jerusalem, and one of the prophecies was that the Messiah would come riding on a donkey in triumph from this spot. So the fact that Jesus does this, it's very intentional. And so it's being the fulfillment of an Old Testament messianic anticipation prophecy. And so they've got this quoted here, and this is a German inscription underneath, and it says, the blind obedience of Jesus to his Father's will led him to enter Jerusalem humbly, sitting upon an ass, knowing that his royal entry would lead to his crucifixion. His blind obedience wrought redemption on Golgotha. Such obedience will bear much fruit today. Now, we're going to talk about this in the notes and in the commentary. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he knew what he was doing. This was calculated. You remember how the Jews had been trying to arrest him before? You remember how they had tried to stone him a couple of times? If you were going to come into Jerusalem and you didn't want to get killed, you'd sneak into town. When he comes over that hill and he gets on that donkey and he's looking like he's being a king, a peaceful king, entering town and everybody gets to watch him, this is a huge statement and takes courage beyond what you and I could muster. Because he knows that coming in, even though they're crying out, Hosanna, blessed are you who comes in the name of the Lord, they're waving their palms, they're going, this is leading to something very difficult right around the corner. So he came into Jerusalem with eyes wide open, and this particular inscription on the, on the entryway to the church does a beautiful job kind of setting the stage for what's going on in this place. All right, on we go. Now this is long and detailed. I don't, I don't think I want to read you the whole thing, but I've got the entire quote in your notes, okay? This talks a little bit more. What, what it's talking about, I don't see, it's in the bold. 
when coming to Bethphage. The modelist chapel was built here in his honor. Here's the deal. Standing on a large rock, which can be clearly seen within the church. The church is about the large rock. And so I'm going to show you the rock when we go inside the church. Okay? The stone of Bethphage. That's what the, ch- the church is built right over the stone. And so, um, let me see here. See where it says large stone? It goes stone, 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 and the thing. So I get you ramped up. We got a big stone coming up. It's very exciting. Father took us to another pile of rocks. Now he takes us to a big stone, for heaven's sake. <clears throat> now there is a quote that, that, um, that's supposed to be a J.O. John, chapter 12, verse, uh, chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. This is in Latin. I've got the Latin inscription in your notes and the English translation. So remember in John, there's a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Only John's gospel talks about the people waving palms. In the other three gospels, they have cut branches, not palms, and they're laying their cloaks on the ground. So this gives you John's version of how that took place. Then you go on to the next one. You see where it says Marcus down here? Chapter 11, 8, 9, and 10. That's part of the gospel that we're going to be doing tonight. So this is in Latin. I've got the Latin quote and the English translation in your notes as well. Remember, we're going to be comparing these two things. Um, I think that you know that when it comes to telling the stories, you know, like for Christmas, you know, Luke has got part, Matthew's got part, and we kind of have like a merge story when we actually tell the story. You know, one talks about the shepherds, the other one talks about the magi. Well, we talk about them both together when we tell the story, right? So what we do is we merge all of the um, Palm Sunday stories when we kind of tell it, but different ones tell it in different directions or different angles. But this is all at the entryway. And here's the church. This is the front of the church. And so it, it, it has the Palm Sunday procession in a fresco up on the front. Are we good on frescoes? We know what a fresco is. A fresco is plaster. It's painting on plaster. Now let's talk about what we have. This center part of the church is called the nave. Okay? I'm standing in the nave as I'm looking forward. The front part of the church, this part up here is called the sanctuary, right? Right? Okay? When you have a rounded thing behind the altar, we don't have one of those. Really, you don't have one of those here. It's called an apse, an A-P-S-E. That's that rounded thing behind it. Now, the thing over the top, the term that you, you would know this term, it's a dome. So when we talk about the location of this picture, it's in the dome of the apse. You got how that location would work? It's really quite big. Now, you know, I'm, I'm a little bold when I come into these churches, and I was in the church all by myself, and I knew, honestly, that the triple arches on the outside are replicated here. And I should have got up there and taken the altar cloth and peeled it back so you could see exactly how it is, but it just escaped me. On the next visit, I'm going to do that so you can see exactly how that works. You'll just have to take it on my word that it does replicate what's on the outside of the church. Now, this small, and this is the entryway to the um, sacristy, and I'm going to take you in the sacristy right at the end of the show and show you a couple of pieces of artwork that are, honestly, they have a couple of the most beautiful pieces of artwork in the entire church hidden in the sacristy. Now, one of the other things I wanted to point out to you is when we get up here, look at this. See this? See those rocks here? See these rocks here? 12th century, 1100s, 1883. You see the difference? What they did is they built this church exactly upon the foundations of the church that preceded it. So it's exactly the same size and dimension. And so when you look at these, a lot of times people come in, they really don't have an observant eye and they're not paying attention to what's going on there. And that's a very important feature. I've actually got a close-up of this particular part of the rock later on in the slideshow. And there's the rock. We'll talk about that more later. So when you're in the front of the church and you look back, this is the way it looks when you're looking at the full length of it from the altar. Not very big, is it? You, You can maybe get 40, 45 people in there. You see that you've got a little thing here, four people across. That's what it would be for about eight or nine rows. And there's not as much seating on this side as there is on this side because the rock is there. Okay? Isn't it colorful? It's not colorful at all. 
So people would look at this and they go, you know, it's kind of dull. It's kind of reddish brown. And the artist did this very intentionally. What's outside? Sand and rock. And what color is it? Reddish brown. So he's trying to, the artist tried to replicate what's going on in the outside environment on the inside of the church. You'll see that there's art pieces along here. We're going to look at all of them. Okay. So this is back up to the, the most, the featured thing of the church is the fresco and the apse. Remember we were talking about the, the foundation, right? Crusader time, 1800s, 19th century. This is the close-up, or the, the entire picture of the fresco. So we have Jesus mounted on the colt. Notice that his feet are both on this side. So if you're sitting on a horse, you've got your one leg on one side and one leg on the other side, right? When you sit on a mule like this and you're coming in and you're going to do it as a king at peace, you sit astride the colt rather than like a horse. This is a difference in the way that you would mount it, okay? Then we've got people in the front of the procession and people in the back, and we're going to look at each of them individually. We're going to look at Jesus first. Notice that Jesus is sitting there with his feet astride in red and white, okay? Red about his mortality, white about his holiness. His hand is always up. we are always got him teaching. We've got a halo on him. We're not going to have very many halos in this picture. We have two. So, I mean, this is going to be a standout in terms of who's got a halo and who doesn't. Now, these are the pe people on the front of the picture. So you've got two young ladies waving palms. This is on the far left. Then we're going to move to the right just a little bit, right in front of Jesus and the donkey. And we've got these four guys. One's putting his cloak down. One's got a, uh, a palm branch. This guy is the mystery guy. <laughs> you know, I have all these books with all these information things. None of them say hardly anything about this church. There is no description about it. I have no idea what the artist was trying to do there. So I'm just going to leave it to you to try and figure it out. Is this a shroud? A shroud. I, you know, that, that would be a pretty big stretch. You know, it could be. I mean, it is a whitish looking garment. And we are anticipating crucifixion very shortly. Okay, here we are in the back. Now, we got one guy, one guy, another guy. We think that that's a guy. This is St. John. So we have Peter and Andrew, um, James, John. So we've got three, four, five, six. And then we got six guys, eight guys. What is it, right? Eight guys. And then we have these three women. Huh? How many halos do you see? Huh? One. And so... It's a, in a person, it's a woman that's wearing blue and white. What do you think? Mary. So Jesus and Mary are the only ones that get halos. These disciples here, they got some bad stuff coming up. You know, they're going to be betraying Jesus, deserting Jesus, and all that stuff. They don't deserve halos yet. So that's part of what the artist is trying to do here. So this is now looking at the church further back so you can see the rock over here. Let's take a look at the rock. There's the rock. There's the rock. So they got a, a, a gate around the rock. So the tradition around the rock happened during the Crusader period. This is the 11th century. What did Crusaders travel on? Horses. What did Jesus travel on? Donkey. Are they different sizes? One is way higher than the other one. So these Crusader soldiers are going... When Jesus came into Jerusalem, he had to step up onto something to get up onto the donkey because they had to step up on something to get up on their horse. And they said, well, certainly, since the Palm Sunday procession began here, he must have stepped up on this rock to get up on his donkey. Do you think that really happened? I mean, the, the, the chance that this happened really is like about zero, 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 okay? But people have venerated this rock as the place where Jesus got onto the donkey for just 900 years. So even though it's not factual, it's a tradition that gives it spiritual importance. Are we good with all that? We like to try and get you the tradition business as a part to the historically accurate stuff so that you can do that. Now, they put an a, a iron gate around it because there's fresco all the way around it. So in 1950, 
they tried to be doing some nice stuff and they were trying to recreate some of the stuff from the Crusader period. And so it's really not in very good shape, but they don't want anybody to deface it. And since I was in the church alone, you know me, Mikey got a chair and he got up and he's... So we got pretty good pictures actually of all four sides of it. Okay. So we're up on the chair now, looking down over the top of the rock. So there's the top of the rock for you. Didn't really have to take very much risk to get this picture for you. All right. Now this is getting up much closer wide angle. You can see that there's a figure here. Barely make out that there's two figures over there. Now, I, don't, I don't know if I have another a picture of that or not. This is Jesus and this is Mary and Martha. Remember that they lived in Bethany, right? Which is like six blocks away from there. So this would be part of the reason why you would picture those three together. Okay? Now here's a crowd of people. You can't make them out very well, but you see that there's individual figures here, little figures there and figures over here. The plaster is not in very good shape. This is the crowd of people that was together on the Palm Sunday deal. And I've got that all explained in your notes too, but whatever. We're even down closer. This is the same picture as the last one, okay? So you see where we are? And now we're going to get a, a close-up of that. So it's, you can't see it real well, but hopefully well enough. Here's the next, oh, I do have another one. I, I, I'm, the previous pictures should have been side by side. And so this is Jesus here, and that's Mary and Martha there. That's the one that we saw three ago. Okay? Oh, there's another one. Okay? Now here's another one, and you can see that there's some people watching, and there's Jesus. Can you see the opening to a tomb there? Maybe you have to stretch yourself a little bit. That's Lazarus coming out of the tomb. This is the raising of Lazarus. And that happened in Bethany, six blocks away. All right. So that's the different sides of the rock of Stele over the church where Jesus stepped on the rock to get onto his donkey, we think. Huh? That's what they, that's what they tell you. And honestly, when I'm in Jerusalem or when we have our pilgrimage groups there and I listen to some of these guides say that this is exactly what happened, oh my goodness. We, we, anyway, so when you, as you go around the church, they have all these scenes and they're associated with Bethany or they're associated with the Palm Sunday deal, okay? And so remember that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived in Bethany right in the next neighboring village. And you'll remember that when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he stayed with them in Bethany. That was the regular place that he stayed. Um, we don't think that they were relatives, but that they were very close friends, and we don't know the history about how their relationship happened, but we know that he went there. You know, they didn't have hotels in those days, you know, so you don't, go, you don't get to go to Motel 6 or Super 8 or wherever you're going to go, um, if, or if you want to go to a nicer place. So anyway, that's the first one. This is on the north um, east corner of the, or northeast part of the wall. Then you move over, then we've got these children that are part of the Palm Sunday procession. And you see we got boys and girls and we have palms and musical instruments and all of that. And then as we continue, we have six of the apostles that were there. You can see them by names. S, that's short, um, that's Latin for saint. And then Petrus, Peter, Andreas, um, Andrew, Thomas, that Jacobi, James, Matthäus, and Philippus. So we, I think that you can figure out who all of those are, huh? Six of the 12 apostles are there. Now that takes care of the north wall. Now we're going to go to the west wall, and there are two scenes on the west wall. Here's one with the boys. So the boys are on one side and the girls are on the other. So we have a boy up in the tree picking off branches that they're going to use for the Palm Sunday procession. And then the ones down below are actually picking them up, getting their cloaks ready to put them out before Jesus. Then we go to the one that's in the southwest corner, and this is the girls. I'm sorry, I cropped this a little bit. There, there are six boys down along the tree, and we have six girls that are down along here. And, and the last one, we had a different kind of tree. Now we got palms, but we're all getting ready for the Palm Sunday procession. Okay, now that's the end of the west wall. Now we're going to go to the south wall, and it has four scenes. So we have these women that are part of the procession. And notice that they all have halos. You know, so we actually, the, the apostles on the other side had halos. Um, that's not the fresco artist. This is a different artist along the side of the church. Here's another one. This one is very eerie. So we have three of the scribes and Pharisees. 
And if you remember, at the end of chapter 11 of John's gospel, after Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead, they conspire about Jesus and say, they are all going over to him. And that's what the inscription is on that scroll. They are all going over to him. And according to John, this is the reason that they conspired to put him to death. Remember in, Ma- in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the cleansing of the temple was the nail in the coffin. In John, the raising of Lazarus is the final event. So the two Gospels have kind of different viewpoints of that. Here's the next one. This is a group of women and children. This kind of prefigures Jesus' passion. Remember in Luke's Gospel how when Jesus is carrying the cross, he meets the women and children of Jerusalem, weep not for me but for yourselves and your children. So this is already part of the Palm Sunday procession, and then we're thinking about the procession uh, on the way to the cross, kind of as an underlying thing here. All right, and then we've got the Roman soldiers. How's that for ominous? So it's quite a combination of things, and this is what you see as you walk your way around the church. Now we've made our way all around the church. Here we are in the sacristy. This is one of the most remarkable pictures of the baptism of Jesus I've ever seen. Remember that when Jesus came back to Bethany and Bethpage, it said that he was coming from Bethany across the Jordan. So he had been out of the city, down by Jericho, a little bit further, maybe by the Jordan River or further, and he was coming back. So this is part of the reason with the association with Bethpage and the Jordan River. Now remember when the Israelites came to the Promised Land, they, had, you know, they were 40 years in the desert. Remember when they brought the Ark of the Covenant and the priests were blowing the horns and the water stopped in the river and all that? That's why that's here. The Jordan River was another important place because Elijah ascended to heaven on his chariot there. Remember that when he went to heaven, Elisha is on the ground saying, I would like to have a double portion of your spirit. And the way that he received it was when Elijah's cloak fell from Elijah down to Elisha who is kneeling on the riverbank. Was this an important event? When they brought the uh, Ten Commandments and all that stuff over, they put the 12 memorial stones along the riverbank. Okay? So maybe you don't know all the details of the story, but it's really an extraordinary piece of art. And then we've got Jesus himself in the river being baptized by John the Baptist. His walking staff has a cross on the top. And then we have Jesus with his arms crossed over his chest. For those of you who are at Daily Mass this morning, we talked about that with regard to Mary, right? And so remember when Mary says, let it be done to me according to your word? This is prefiguring Jesus in Gethsemane, not my will but your will be done. So Mary and Jesus both do the obedience thing, and that was the thing that we talked about so much this morning, about how important it is to be obedient to God's word. This is the, one of the very few peaches where I've seen two angels there on a cloud, with a towel, when you're done with your baptism, we're going to try and get you taken care of. How's that for interesting? So that's in the sacristy, and this one's right next to it. And this is really a gorgeous Palm Sunday procession portrayal in art. And so we've got a lot of kids in the front, just like we had in the other one, but it's not all kids. I wish I had done a close-up with my telephoto, because there's some adults in the back and there's some adults over here. So you have this combination of people that are praising him and then the Jewish officials going, oh, he's coming, you know? And then we've got the apostles back here. But one of the things that I'd really like to point out is they're kneeling. And these ones are kneeling. So you have that veneration business about Jesus being the king of the Jews and being the promised Messiah. Some people believe, and then we've got the critics that were back here at the entrance to the gate. And so this is the gate of Jerusalem, and this is the wall around Jerusalem as he's coming into the city. All right. Now, the rest of this is going to be, we're off-site now. We're just going to look at artwork that does this. And so the triumphal entry into the city is in all four Gospels. And so Luke, I mean, I had a stained glass window that did that, so it's not the only one. This is one of my favorite ones. This is on the front page of our bulletin this week, okay? And so this is, uh, this is at a Lutheran church. Get a load of that in Canby, Minnesota. Our Savior Lutheran Church, one of the most beautiful art churches I've been in in the state of Minnesota. And so it's got Jesus on the donkey the, and all of this as he comes in. This is a little bit more close-up of it. Very nice. All right. 
Um, I wanted, you know, we've gone on a trip to Ireland. This is at St. Finbar's. I, knew, I thought you would like going to St. Finbar's. And so this is in Cork. And so, uh, you know, it was kind of medieval kind of art, but it's a, it's a different kind of thing. But for completeness sake and going to different places in the world, we needed to do that. Actually, the stuff that's coming is from all over the place. Here's one. This is from the country of Jordan in Madaba. And so this is a, a mosaic. This one um, is at a church in Jer- No, this is in Bethlehem. This is at Th- St. Theodosius. Um, St. Theodosius is a kind of an interesting place. It's beyond Bethlehem as you go out to the desert. And uh, t- p- pilgrimage groups don't go there because it's just kind of out of the way. And so, uh, but I was there once and I had a, a date excursion and said, what the heck, let's go. This is at the Romanian Patriarchate in Jerusalem. This is at, um, in Jericho. Remember we went to the Mount of Temptations? We, we've, we've done that before, you know? We did that right at the beginning of Lent. And you remember um, that, that on the icon, Icostanasis, that big icon thing at the front? It's got all those scenes. This is one of the scenes um, there in Jericho. This is right here in the state of Minnesota. This is at the church in Renville, Minnesota. And I don't remember where that's. I think this is in Rogers. Now we're going to Spain. This is in Salamanca. And so, um, you know, a lot of the things that they do are sculptures there. So you can see Jesus, and he's on the donkey with his disciples back way behind him, and then the people in the procession. See the palm trees up on the top. So, I mean, this is an art all over the place. This is a little bit more close up. You see Jesus there, a disciple with a, oh my goodness, he's got his halo. There's the people behind. There's the right-hand side. Now, we've completed the pictures that show you the Palm Sunday procession. Now we're going to look at a couple of the symbols of it. I have an article in your packet on the palms. And so these next ones are just going to portray palms. Um, And this is part of the business that was in John's Gospel that has hearkening back to the Old Testament. And this would be the way that you would welcome a king when the king came into your city. And so I have that all explained there. These are both in the church in Osakis. More palms, I mean, palms. There's a palm with a, a Latin cross because we're going hail to Jesus and it's going to lead to his cross. This is a very interesting one. This is at a church that I was at in Belgium where it's got the palms here, but it has the cross right in the middle. Both of them do. It's common to associate them. And then sometimes you see the Hosanna word with it too. We're going to go into that in kind of detail when we get to that right at the end. There's another window with Hosanna. Another one, Hofana. Hosanna. And then as we talked about when we began, we're kind of finishing as we began. This is at the uh, Russian uh, Church of the Ascension on Mount of Olives. And this is the painting in the front of the church. Okay? There are all 93 of them. There you have it. Okay. A few minutes after seven, we're in a good shape. Any questions or comments about the slideshow before we move on? Yes. Did you ever come to any sort of insight of why those two pieces of art were inside the sacristy and not? (laughs) So the question is uh, did you ever come into any insight about why their pieces are in the sacristy? I have no idea. So usually what happens though is that um, they'll get a church all set up art-wise, and then somebody will come forward with another beautiful art piece and they got no place to put it. You know, so, and it ends up going in the sacristy rather than in the main church. I mean, so when I was at St. Stephen's, I put a couple of art pieces in the confessional just because we didn't have any place to put it, you know? So uh, one of the places that I thought was most remarkable about that, you know, I go on trips all over, and so I was at Christ the King Cathedral in Superior, Wisconsin. And the church has got unbelievable stained glass windows. I went into the sacristy, and they had some of the most beautiful stained glass windows I have ever seen in the sacristy. And so I'm, when I go on tour, I never stop with the church. I just keep exploring. Look in the confessionals, look in the sacristy, go up in the choir loft. Because it's amazing where you find artwork tucked away. Um, one of the most, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Baroon, Minnesota. 
It's about six or seven miles south of Hinckley, and there's a little church in Barun. And so I went there, and it's got the uh, Joyful Mysteries on one side and the Glorious Mysteries on the other side, and I'm walking up to the choir loft, and in the hallway along the stairway, it has one of the most beautiful stained glass windows of Christ the King I've ever seen in the hallway or the stairway to the choir loft. So you just never stop looking. I, <laughs> do we have anything hidden in here? We've actually, I think, down at A14. You know that picture of Jesus looking over Jerusalem down in A14? I think that that's one of the nicest pictures of Jesus looking over Jerusalem I have ever seen, and it's not in our main church. Really, it's just gorgeous. And there's a picture of uh, Pope John Paul II down there, very beautiful picture of him. And there's also a kind of a stylized resurrection cross that's in A14. So um, we don't have it all up here. So yeah, yeah, we have, I think we have a little bit that's hidden. Actually, our nicest statue of the Blessed Mother is in the Daily Mass Chapel. And actually, the crucifix in the Daily Mass Chapel is really nice. We need that same word. Thank you for bringing up that very good observation. <laughs> what else do you have? Yeah. How did the church get to take in the palms and burn in them to be the ashes on it? Oh, I should know this. The question is, how did the church get to the practice of taking the palms and burning them and then using them for the ashes? I know that there's an explanation for it, but I just, I don't have it for you. I did write an article on ashes, um, but I did it a long time ago, and I'd have to go back and review. Are we ready for the next part? All right. So normally we are looking at the lower right-hand side, um, but we're not doing it this time because the gospel starts, so we're going to start with it on the upper left. And then I have a couple of the readings from Mass, but I, I didn't put the Passion in here. So we just have a, 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 a portion of this. But we're going to focus on the part on the upper left, okay? So here we go. This is the reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark, and this is the beginning of chapter 11. So as the crowd drew near Bethpage and Bethlehem on the Mount of Olives, close to Jerusalem, Jesus sent off two of his disciples with the instruction, go into the village straight ahead of you, and as soon as you enter it, you will find tethered there a colt on which no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it back. If anyone says to you, why are you doing that? Say, the master needs it, but he will send it back here at once. So they went off and finding a colt tethered out on the street near a gate, they untied it. Some of the bystanders said to them, what do you mean by untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, and the men let them take it. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks across its back, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread reeds which they had cut in the fields. Those preceding him, as well as those who followed, cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the reign of our father David to come. God save him from on high. The Gospel of the Lord. So we'll take a couple minutes now of silent meditation. So if you'd like to share a word or a short phrase, please feel free to do that. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus 
sent out two of his disciples. Jesus sent out two of his disciples. The master needs it. Looks like we're good to go with that few. That's all right. So are there any questions or comments before we start? I guess, go ahead, Kenny. It says, blessed be the name of our Father, day would be come, they would make the, that is the political deal. Right? It would what? Where, where they said, blessed be the reign of our Father, day would be come. Right. Would mean, you're more looking at this like a political deal. Oh, absolutely. So the, the comment is, blessed is um, the reign of our Father, David, to come. And so Kenny's comment is they're looking at this as kind of a political deal. Remember that the confusion over what the Messiah would be, we've talked about that a lot. Is he going to be a king? So is he going to be a secular ruler? Is he going to be a military general? One of the things that they're hoping for is liberation so that they would be an independent country again. And so they had been independent under David. And he had, I mean, so they had freedom from all of their enemies. Remember they talked about that? And so at this particular time, they're being under Roman suppression, and they're hoping and praying that they're going to have a leader like David that's going to liberate them. And so they're thinking about political liberation, and Jesus is thinking about spiritual liberation and liberating people from their sins. But your point here is huge when it comes to the Messiah, because remember that the prophet Nathan spoke to uh, David right before he died, and so he's speaking on behalf of God and saying, a son from your loins is going to take your throne, and he's going to have an everlasting reign, and he's going to be supreme. So this was one of the messianic prophecies that was given to David. So if we're talking about the one who's in the line of David, who's going to be a king like David, they're saying that Jesus would be the fulfillment of the messianic promise. Okay? Uh Uh-huh. He'd be on the throne, right, he'd be on the throne forever. He'd be an even greater king than David. And that had been the greatest king in the history of the country. So remember that there were three great kings during the monarchy. Saul was first, and then David was second, and then Solomon was third, and then things broke up after Solomon. Then we had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom rather than a united kingdom. So that happened in the 10th century B.C., around 930 or so, when the the kingdom divided. But it it had been united for about 100 years, 40 years under David, 40 years under Solomon, and I don't know how long um, Saul's kingdom last, kingship lasted. Yeah. So is Jesus getting, like, some divine knowledge here? Because, like, he knows that that cult is going to, like, be there. Or did he, like, set it up somewhere? So your question is one of the great questions that gets debated back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, okay? Did he have divine foreknowledge, a sign of his omniscience, or did he prearrange it? Uh, I think the majority of scholars are saying that he prearranged it. And the fact of the matter is that he went to Bethany so often, and Bethany and Bethpage are so close by, for him to go on and say, you know, get, get this all arranged, have the cult out there, have it tied up along the street, the code word is the master has need of it. When they say the master has need of it, you know that it's the right guy. Because I was going to say, did like Lazarus put it there or something? Well, that would be interesting to say. I mean, so you could do a spirituality around Lazarus did it. That would, that would add a little more interest to the story, you know. But I, I think that most of us say that Jesus prearranged it. And I've got a little piece in the notes about divine foreknowledge as opposed to prearrange. So it's a, it's a good question. It's been asked a lot. Are we ready to turn the page? So those of you at home, you've already got your pages probably turned. 
because you had a chance to print out these notes earlier before the session began. All right. But at any rate, so we're going to be on page one of your notes. You're all set to go, huh? Okay. So the liturgical use. This gets used once a year, okay? We have one. Uh, this is the only time that you'd use it. You don't, wouldn't use it for any other occasion. And remember, in the liturgical cycle, we have A, B, and C, right? So there are four versions of Palm Sunday. So in year A, we always use Matthew. And in year C, we always use Luke. And in year B, which is the year of Mark, you can use Mark or John. Because we don't want to lose John altogether. But because it's B, I chose that we would do the Mark version. Okay? And so the parallel gospel accounts, I have the other versions listed there. Yeah? So we use the Matthew version of this as the... In year A. In year A as this gospel before the procession? Yep. So there's a Palm Sunday of triumphal entry into Jerusalem in all four Gospels. And then all four Gospels have their own passion narrative as well. And each one of them has their little wiggles that are different. And that's part of the reason why we take each one of them so we can pay attention to them all. Okay? And so the Gospels shift. And so really now Jesus is completely done with his Galilean ministry. We're heading to Jerusalem and we're going to Jerusalem for the last time. Now it depends upon who you read in the um, synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it looks like Jesus goes to Jerusalem once. In John's Gospel, it looks like Jesus goes to Jerusalem back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Which one is it? Actually, Matthew, Mark, and Luke really want to focus on the Galilean ministry so they don't talk about you going back and forth. But when you look at the kinds of relationships that Jesus had, and the knowledge that he had of Jerusalem, there's no way he could have done that on a one-time deal. So it's really likely that he went to Jerusalem at least once a year, if not more. And he knew the scene really well, and he had a lot of people connections and all of that, okay? So actions speak louder than words. So the, the, this big paragraph, when the words of the prophets failed to move people, they did something dramatic to get their attention. You know, so you speak to them, speak to them, speak to them. If they won't listen, then we're going to do something bold that's really going to grab their attention, all right? So Jesus could have come into Jerusalem on foot, couldn't have he? Now, we talked about the reason about him coming into Jerusalem in hiding, but one of the ways that he could have come was just like any regular person would, walking into town, and he chooses not to do it. Now, the the prophets were upset with people because they hadn't listened, so then they have to do something more extreme. Jesus had a, a lot of followers, but in Jerusalem, he had a lot of people that didn't listen to him. So this is part of the doing something extreme to get their attention. Now, the next paragraph talks about the defining moment. I think that William Barclay does just a terrific job describing here what's going on in Jesus' mind and what he's doing. And we described this earlier, okay? That with all of the stuff that had happened against him, he would have, under normal circumstances, snuck into town. And the fact that he is deciding to do this in a very open and public way, almost in an in-your-face kind of way, a defiant kind of way, I'm going to make a statement. I'm coming into Jerusalem. I'm doing it on the donkey. You all know what this means it's a symbol of the Messiah, and I'm sitting here on the donkey, and I chose to do it. And he knew that the chief priest would go crazy because you're claiming to be the Messiah and you can't. And he knows what the end on that's going to be. All right. The very last line there of that um, big defining moment paragraph, um, or any, any man who um, tries to... So what's going on here is that Jesus knows he's going against the religious establishment. You, have you ever gone against the establishment? Like when I'm over at the U, I'm going to go all after the establishment of the University of Minnesota. I mean, so I'm, go to the chancery. I'm going to take down the chancery. I mean, you know what the chances of taking down these big organizations are? And, and if you go to a group, so like Jesus is coming into town and saying the way that you're doing religion is wrong, and it's a fraud, and it's it's all a charade, and the way you do business is totally flawed. You know how the leadership's going to feel about that, right? They're going to go berserk. And so what he's doing here is he's doing a huge critique on the way they're doing business, and they couldn't stand for it. But he's going, i got to give you one last shot at this gospel of love, 
and this gospel of service and this gospel of generosity the way that God wants it to be done, not the way you're doing it. You got how that would, how, what a powerful thing that is? Anyway, okay. So we're on the bottom of the page now with the journey motif. And so when you look in, um, the, the main journey motif gospel is Luke, but even in Mark you have it. He's up in Galilee, goes out here, then he goes to Jericho, then he goes to Bethany across the Jordan, then he comes back. Now we're going to, to uh, Bethany, to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, to Jerusalem. We're traveling here and we're on a mission. So the journey motif and the mission thing and accepting God's will is all part of the underlay of what's going on here. So it says that when they drew near to Jerusalem, who is they? So we got this big crowd of people there, right? Now, when we looked at the artwork, you saw that you got the apostles behind them, right? And then you got Mary and Martha and uh, Mary and Martha, Mary the, the mother of Jesus and the other Mary and Martha, okay? There's a bunch of other women. It says later on in the gospel that there are many, many women that came down from Galilee to accompany him. So we've got all these kids that are there. We've got a big crowd of people around. How big was it? We don't know how big it was. But it was big enough that it really made a public statement and a public impression, all right? And then you've got the other people are, I wonder what this is. So they're not all believers and they're not all followers. You've got onlookers and spectators that are going to be there too. And then you've got some of the chief priests and the scribes and all of them. They're watching this going, we've got trouble here. This guy's got way too many people following him that we're comfortable with, and we've got to do something about this. So the crowd is a big mix. On to the next page we go. Huh? And this is Passover too, right? It's right at Passover. So Passover is going to be on Friday, and we're on Sunday. So we're five days ahead of Passover. And that's not very well described here, but when you were looking at John's Gospel, the chronology is very carefully spelled out. Okay? So when we're on the top of page three, we have that opening paragraph about that page. Well, we just did three page of it, pages of it, huh? You got enough? I don't think we need to redo that. Then we have the next part about Bethany. And Bethany is, uh, as, uh, I've got a separate slideshow on that. And we do it on the raising of Lazarus and, you know, for whatever. Um, it has its own church, but it was very close nearby. And it's the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We're on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives, there's a number of mounts. You've got Mount Zion, you've got Mount Moriah, you've got Mount Olives, you've got Mount Scopus. You've got all these really high hills that are in Jerusalem. Mount Moriah is 2,500 feet. Mount of Olives is 2,700 feet. Mount of Olives is a little bit higher than Jerusalem itself. So it's a huge vantage point. When you go there these days, you've got the Russian Orthodox Church of the Ascension, you've got the Potter Noster, you've got Dominus Flavit, you've got the Russian Orthodox Church of St. Mary Magdalene, you've got the... Uh, Gethsemane Church, the Church of All Nations. It's just churches all up and down the side of the Mount of Olives. And then when you go off on the south side, it's all tombs. And on the all tombs, in the Old Testament, it says that the resurrection of the dead is going to begin on the Mount of Olives. And if you want to be well positioned on the last day, on Judgment Day, you want to go to heaven like first, you have to be buried there. It's amazing. You know, when I, I, I think that you know that I did my hospital chaplaincy in Chicago at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center. And so um, I was there for the death of a Jewish patient. And so I'm walking in, and they're very orthodox, and they wouldn't allow them to take the needles out. We have to leave the blood and all that sort of thing. And they said, well, we have to arrange now for transportation to the Mount of Olives Cemetery. And I'm thinking they're talking about the Mount of Olives Cemetery in suburban Chicago. <laughs> and I'm going like, oh, they're getting prepared to transport the body to the airplane to fly it across the ocean to be buried on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. And so the belief even today about that is amazing. Anyway, the, the Mount of Olives is a, you know, it's a very important place. Jesus spent a lot of time there. Off we go. So Jesus sent um, these two disciples. Is Jesus, does he have the authority to send disciples? He is like the man of commission. So he commissions all 12 apostles at various times, and he has the one, the authority to send us to. He had power over them. He has power over us. Okay? So he sent two of his disciples. Could one disciple have gotten the job done? Absolutely. Why send two? Huh? There's strength in numbers. 
And really and truly, when it comes to bearing witness, uh, mutual support, being able to do testimony, helping to withstand persecution, helping to withstand temptation, two are going to be stronger than one, okay? Jesus understood this business about partnership. So this pastor worries about people who want to be in ministry as lone rangers. I want to be in charge of this, and I want to do it alone. He's like, "Uh uh-oh, because that's really a kind of a contrary to the way that Jesus does business. He wants us to get along and to work together and be partners in serving Him. And this sending them to as a twosome here is one more example of that priority. Okay? Anyway. When He, he sent them out to begin with, He sent them out in groups of two. Right? He did. So that's earlier in the gospel when He sent them out two by two. Go to the towns that I'm going to be visiting, cure the sick, expel demons, preach the gospel. Exact, you got exactly the right thing. Well, there I have it. I actually have the quote in there, Mark, Mark 6, 7. And so we're in chapter 11, so he had done that earlier in the gospel. Okay, so he's actually going to say later that two guys are going to go off and make the preparations for the Passover as well. So you see that two-by-two two principle. And now, now we're on the top of page 3. Remember that wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there. So you have that particular piece too. And so ministry done by two or more um, provides mutual support, fraternal correction, corroboration, reliable instruction. I've got all the reasons listed there. You know, when I've done a whole bunch of retreats uh, for school teachers at the beginning of the school year. And they're in their classroom. Teachers are in their classroom with their students alone. And one of the things that teachers start to think is that this is my, this is my class this is my room, and I do this by myself. And I'm going, "Uh uh-uh. You're on the faculty, you're on here a group of people. Now, actually, with our increase in enrollment, now we have two sections of kindergarten, two sections of first grade, two sections of second grade. So if you're a kindergarten teacher, you are teaching in collaboration with the other kindergarten teacher. If you're a first grade teacher, you're in collaboration with the other one. But if you're teaching fourth grade and you're the only fourth grade teacher, you're still in collaboration with the fifth grade teacher and the third grade teacher and with the specialists and with the principal. So I try and go over with the teachers over and over and over again that even though this is your own classroom, this is a team effort when you're teaching. But really and truly, depending upon whatever job you've got, I mean, if you're in sales at Kohl's and you're in the one department and there's another department, we're all working together, okay? And so from job after job and place after place, it's not about being the Lone Ranger, it's being a good partner because you get a lot of really great things done when you're in partnership with other people. And that's part of the Jesus principle here. Are we good on that? So be nice to each other when you leave tonight. Be good in your families and be good to your kids and be good to your spouse and whatever. You can be the sacristan alone because you're in partnership with Deacon Rick and the pastor etc. Good? So, he says, go to the village opposite. Well, I mean, so where is the village opposite? Well, where was Jesus when he gave the instruction? So, the thought was that he was in Bethany with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, right? So, if he's going to the village or the village opposite or the village nearby, that would be Bethpage, right? You only have to go six blocks to do this. It was very close by, part of the reason why we would have it prearranged, okay? So, you're going to find the cold tethered there. So Jesus predicted that his disciples would find the animal, and he made other predictions too. And so um, Barclay is very clear about talking about how this was prearranged. Now, in the third line, Jesus may have been de- demonstrating divine foreknowledge. We talked about that before, but there's a simple answer about that prearranging it. Okay, now the business about the cult. Remember that little inscription I showed you on the beginning uh, at the entryway to the church from Zechariah chapter 9? Verse 9, I've got it here, okay? And so what happens in the middle of the paragraph, if you see, this is to fulfill the prophecy, okay? The donkey symbolizes humility, peace, and the Davidic dynasty. The Davidic dynasty meaning um, Saul, David, Solomon, and a king that's going to be in the line of David, okay? So a worldly king, a power king, would have ridden into the city on a horse. And it would have been a demonstration of power and to impress people. Okay? When you're coming in on a donkey, this is all about peace. This is a peaceful king rather than a war king. And Jesus is showing something quite different, and it fulfills the prophecy in Zechariah. 
Now, we're going to sit on, yeah, go ahead. Who was the other person who did that, that you taught us about? Did what? That came in on a donkey or took off all his kingly robes or something. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's not scriptural. You're talking about Heraclius. Heraclius was the Byzantine emperor who came to Jerusalem with the true cross. And he was on a horse. And he had all of his regal attire on, and the gates to the city were locked. Okay? And an angel appeared to him and said, so you think you're going to go into Jerusalem after the way Jesus came in here meekly on a donkey while you're riding on this big horse in all of your regal attire? He took off all of his regal attire. He wore a tunic, and, and he went in barefoot, and the, the gates to the city instantly opened. So thank you for remembering that. I did, now tell me more about that. But we, we, we got there eventually. Okay? Sure. Now, we got an animal upon which no one has ever sat. Now, an animal that somebody had sat on or had been a pack animal, it would have been defiled, impure, dirty, because it was already used. So we want the virgin version of this, clean, never been used before, then it's sacred, and then it's worthy of the Son of God, it's worthy of the Messiah when it comes in. So you see the difference on that? Hopefully that's not too complicated. And a new young cult. I love this. So this Bruce Barton, he's a commentator for the Life Application New Testament Commentary. And he said, so we got this brand new cult hitched right outside this house. And the owner of this house, or the owner of the cult, is uh, looking out there going, that's my nice new cult that nobody has ever used. And he says, it's just like somebody coming down the street and saying, will you lend me your new car? Would you lend them your new car that nobody had ever driven before? But I mean, when you put it in those terms, it's like, wow, that's a pretty big deal that you let that cult go. At any rate. So then when they, the code word is um, the master has need of it, and he's referring to himself as the master. In Mark's gospel, Jesus never does that. This is the one and only time that he calls himself the master but it's also on the day that we're going to ride into Jerusalem as the new Messiah. See what's going on here? Now, in the Old Testament, remember that we've got some words in Hebrew that you use for God. Elohim, El, Yahweh, Adonai. You've heard those words before? Now, when they translated the Bible from Greek or from, from Hebrew to Greek, they used one word, to translate all of them. Kyrios, Kyrie. You know when we do Kyrie, Laisan, Lord have mercy? So it means, in, in Greek, Kyrie means Lord or Mister or gentleman, but they gave it a high exalted meaning. And so Jesus is using the word that the Septuagint, Septuagint, Septuagint used for God for himself. You see what we're going on, got going on here? You have to understand the linguistic on it to understand why it's such a big deal. So the master has need of it. It's a big claim. Okay? Now, we're, we're on page four. The master has need of it. We've just seen it with the coronavirus. So during the coronavirus, the president goes to the pharmaceutical companies and said, you don't get to do this and that. You have to produce the vaccine. He just commandeered certain businesses this is kingly prerogative that you can just come in and take what you want in an emergency situation. So when Jesus says, I want the colt, I want your new car, he has enough authority to take it because the king gets to do what he wants. So this is another sign of his kingship, okay? So the kingly prerogative, um, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff in here, examples at the beginning of the paragraph where the king can ask you to do this or that or any other thing. Remember that Jesus, the king, has prerogative with you and me. So if Jesus came and knocking on your door saying, I'd like your car now, would you give it to him? He said, you know something? Um, I'm knocking on your door. I see you haven't contributed any money to the church at all. And I think really it's probably a good idea that you would, you know, do at least two or three percent. I know I said ten before, but at least do two or three. Okay? 
I'm coming into your house, you've got a closet full of clothes, and there's some needy people down the street. Let me say you pull out three or four of those, and let's give them away. You see what the kingly prerogative is? And so the kingly prerogative is like, oh, it applied to them, but it doesn't apply to me. Ugh. It applies to all of us. Isn't this terrible when there's so many concrete applications? We have to work with other people. We have to be generous. We have to take our orders from Jesus. Really? Anyway, so they went off and found the colt. Get a load of these two disciples. Jesus says, I want you to go. There's going to be a colt out there. And they go, I really wonder if this is going to be a wild goose chase or not. You think a colt will actually be there? You think the guy will actually give it to us? No, they could have said this is stupid and not gone. They went on blind faith. You see how they're taking their orders? The way they're taking their orders on blind faith to do what God wants, that's a model for us too. Okay, so they found the colt. They did it on the street. Now, the fact that they did it on the street in town means that a whole lot of people are seeing it, right? So this is reason for witness value because then the people are going to say, why did you do this? And they'll say, the master, who's your master? Jesus. He told us to do this. Who's Jesus? And then they have an opportunity to testify about their faith. So you see how that's built in the opportunity to share things? So when you and I are doing good things on behalf of what Jesus, and then people ask us questions about it, instead of going, why are you being so nosy? You go, oh man, I have an opportunity to testify. I have an opportunity to share about Jesus. And remember, evangelization is the fourth sign of a dynamic Catholic. And we want to be dynamic. We want to be his missionaries sharing his gospel because we don't do that just in church. The most important place to do that is beyond the church. Okay? So the bystanders are asking the question, which is all by design. And so they welcome the questions. And so this deal here is that when people come to us and ask questions, we shouldn't be pushing them off. We should welcome the opportunity and then go and follow up with them. So then, on the next paragraph down on page five, they answered them, Jesus, Jesus had taught them. Isn't that good? I mean, they could have given, come up with some other answer, but they used the Jesus answer when they did their response. So you and I, we get the Jesus answer when we're here in church. When we hear the, the scripture readings, we've got the Jesus answer. When we're doing Bible study, we get the Jesus answer. So we're able to tell other people what the Lord told us, okay? And we got the business about the fourth sign of the dynamic Catholic and all of that in there. Okay, so they brought the cult to Jesus and put their cloaks over it. So bringing the cult to Jesus, that's not very far. I mean, they're going from Bethpage to Bethany. Or if they you know, take it from Bethany to Bethpage, I mean, we're going to start the Palm Sunday procession, traditionally at least, in Bethpage. They put their cloaks over it. They didn't typically put saddles on these. They put saddles on horses, but they didn't put saddles on, um, on donkeys. But is it appropriate for a king to ride an animal bareback? And the answer to that would be no. So by putting their cloaks on the animal, they're trying to show Jesus reverence and being able to acknowledge him then as the Messiah. So then Jesus sits on the colt, and you saw the pictures and how he sits astride and how he's coming in like a peaceful king. So riding a donkey like a king of David, we've, I mean, this is a little bit repetitive because we got the Zechariah thing again, but when you put the cloaks on it, you're, doing, you're invoking all of that imagery. Okay? Now we're going up to the top of page six. Now Jesus, when he rode the donkey into Jerusalem, he's being an agent of peace and he's being humble. You know the saying we have about somebody riding their high horse? <laughs> you know, people can be a little full of themselves and they like to demonstrate their power and their authority and all of these other things. And so this little piece here is about how much grandstanding do we do and how much gloating do we do and all of that. And there's a big challenge here about being the humble kind of people that we ought to be. So many people spread their cloaks on the road. So now it's not just the apostles doing it, but a lot of the other bystanders that are part of this deal. And cloaks on the road. This next part is not from the prophet Zechariah, but it's from 2 Kings. So Jehu was one of the great kings during the Old Testament times. And when he was declared king and when he moved about, they put their cloaks on the ground. And so this is something that the people who knew their Old Testament well were familiar with this imagery. So spreading your cloaks on the ground was part of the way that you welcomed the king. As a matter of fact, the leafy branches, I don't know how much of this I put on there, 
uh, the bottom paragraph there about the historical cultural note. These days we got asphalt and we have concrete. In those days they had dirt roads. Okay? So, if you get a dirt road in a, on the fringe of the desert and it has a lot of traffic, you have a lot of dust. And the more traffic you have, the more dust you have in the air, it's almost like a cloud of dust. Is a cloud of dust the appropriate way to welcome a king as he comes into your city? And the answer to that is pretty obvious, it's no. So how do you control the dust? You cut down leafy branches, you make sure they're wet, and you lay them on the ground. If you want to give even more exaltation, you can put some cloaks down there too, and all of a sudden you've got a path for the king with no dust, and it's a good experience. You see how we're honoring the king by doing that, okay? So that's the end of page six. And now we're on page seven, the last page of all the stuff. Maybe I should take a breath. Um, any questions or comments you have before we go on to our last thing, our home stretch? Are we doing okay? Yeah, Carolee. So the question is a real good question. Was Jerusalem more fertile when we talked about coming to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey? It's going to be so wonderful. Well, when they got there, well, it's not as much milk as honey as we thought. So when you're down at Jericho, remember, it's a great big oasis, beautiful. When you go, to Jer go up to Galilee, the Galilee is very fertile. The Galilee gets as much rain as we get here in Minnesota, maybe even a little bit more. You can grow crops and everything like crazy. But it was desert, okay? Jerusalem was. There's a little bit more growing right up in Jerusalem than it is when you go off into the wilderness of Judea. But it wasn't like the panacea and, you know, the, the, everything that they ever thought it would be right there in Jerusalem. But Jerusalem was always the capital city of that area, even for the Canaanites that were there before. And so you've got the headquarters and then the land flowing in milk and honey was more around it rather than right at that spot. But that's a real good question about how it was. Anything else? Okay, off do we go. So, those preceding him as well as those following him kept crying out. So this is a pretty big crowd. It's so big that you have to bunch, have a bunch in the front and a bunch in the back. They split up to get around him and kind of encircle him, all right? So they're crying out, Hosanna. Now the way, I, I've, you know, as a kid when I'm growing up, Hosanna, praise Jesus. Hosanna, praise Jesus. You know, is this get the kind of the praise kind of thing in it. It's evolved into that. That's not what it meant originally. Okay? So what does it mean originally? It's a cry for help, which means save us, we pray. Lord, save us. Now, it's a cry for God to break into history to bring salvation. It's a cry for the Hosanna. It's a cry for the Messiah, right? Remember the word Jesus, it's derived from Joshua, and it means God saves. So when we're crying out, God save us, that's being answered in the presence of Jesus, who is the Messiah. But I mean, that's a pretty careful nuance on the word. And it says, then it goes on and says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Who comes in the name of the Lord? The Messiah comes in the name of the Lord. So another name for the Messiah was he who, or the one who is coming. So if one who is coming is the name of the Messiah, and Hosanna is asking for the guy who is the Messiah to save you, that's an invocation. It's not saying praise the Lord. It's saying God save us, send us the Messiah, and this one is the guy. Okay? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is taken from Psalm 118. It's a Hallel, Hallel song. Now there's, I don't know how many Psalms there are. I think that there's about a half a dozen of them that are Hallel's. They're praise psalms. So this is part of the thing that gets it confusing. So Psalm 145, 146, 147, 148, 149, and 150, the last six are all Hillel's. But there are other ones earlier in Scripture that are also praise psalms at any rate. Now, find fickle friends. How is that for a nice word? For those of you who were at the penance service, you've heard this explained in detail. Remember we talked about the three people that offend, the three groups of people who offended Jesus on Good Friday? 
You have the crowd, the Roman soldiers, and the chief priests and the scribes. This is referring to the crowd. Remember how they're going, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna? And then five days later, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Not this one, send away Barabbas, but not this one. You know, and then they're jeering him from the cross. When we talk about fine, you know, we talk about fine feathered friends, we talk about fine fickle friends. How would you like, uh, in the homily, I said, with friends like this, who needs enemies? I mean, really and truly, they were turncoats on him. So you have this event going on where they're really not being authentic. Their faith is not deep at all. And God wants a deep faith out of us. He wants us to say, Hosanna to Jesus. You're the king of, you're in the line of David. You're the Messiah. And believe it with all our hearts and follow him with our entire life. The people in the crowd didn't do that very well. Actually, his disciples didn't do it worth a hoot. But the disciples all came back. You know, they were all reconciled to Jesus, except for Judas Iscariot, of course. And they all became heroic in the way that they followed him. So, there we go. And the kingdom of our father David, so what I've got in that um, paragraph right at the bottom of page 7 is the quotation that God through Nathan gives to David saying that somebody's going to take your throne. So there's a number of great messianic promises in the Old Testament. One in Deuteronomy chapter 18 in which God speaks to Moses and said there's going to be another great teacher like you who's going to give my word to my people. So Jesus is going to be the one promised by Moses. Jesus is going to be the one promised to David. And then there's another, a number of other psalms and other places where you see it. Messianic expectation is really all over the Old Testament. But when we talk about, hail, you know, you who are of the kingdom of my father David, we're getting that peace very, very strongly. And Jesus is in the highest. And you know, these people were praying with psalms, weren't they? And it's a great way for us to pray too. I think we've covered it. Now, I think that maybe you remember, maybe you don't. Next Thursday is Holy Thursday. So we're going to be having Mass at 7 rather than Bible study at 6.30. So there will be no Bible study next week. And then we will resume on that first Thursday after um, Easter. And then we're going to be, the plan is to do the four um, Thursdays of April and the four Thursdays of May. So we've got eight to go. Great. I think that concludes it then. So thank you very much for coming and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in.